Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Farhan Lalji. I'm the VP of Business Development for Peer Index. Uh, you might think you know Peer Index, but you really don't. Um, so hopefully, I'll tell you a little bit about us later on. Um, but what I really want to start off talking about as we talk about the age of context is how did we get here? Uh, and really, up until about the 1980s, 500 years before that, marketing changed at a very slow pace. You know, you'd see these new innovations come about every 100 years, every 50 years, then every 35 years. Um, marketers were, were really kind of, they were changing but in a very slow pace. And the whole time, they were broadcasting. They were, it was a one-way conversation, right? Research was done very slowly. Um, we didn't really know as much about customer preferences around what went on in the customer's life outside of when they were using our product. Um, and really in the last 30 years, that's changed dramatically. Um, from the 1980s, you know, the change started to happen a little bit more dramatically, but really with the internet and mobile telecoms, we've seen things change at a much quicker pace. Um, and now we know a lot more about our customers. We know a lot more about their habits. We know a lot more about what they're doing outside of when they're using our products. But the question is, do we have context? Now, it's really easy to look at social media, look at Facebook, look at Twitter, and start to make conclusions. But the difficulty is to really kind of measure and, and determine what the impact is of what we're seeing. Um, I love this. This is the, if you search for Leaning Tower of Pisa or holding up the Leaning Tower of Pisa, you'll get thousands of people that are looking like they're holding up the Leaning Tower of Pisa. And I think this is a great analogy for how we're looking at social media. You know, we don't really know how far away people are from the Tower of Pisa. We don't know how tall they are or how wide they are or, or any of those kind of dimensions. Um, it's not until you start to really look at the context, look at the scenarios deep inside, that you can determine the true nature of individuals. And this is the way I kind of look at the whole kind of marketing flywheel. Um, there's the performance marketing at the top, you know, your search engine optimization, your search engine marketing, your display advertising, your retargeting, your DSPs and RTB and all of that. That's really when somebody has uh, a desire to purchase already. And then they interact with your product or service in real life, right? They're actually seeing, do I like this? Am I going to be using this product or service? And then after that actual interaction, that's where we start to lose real kind of insights. We start to lose that connection with individuals who have bought our product. But that's really one of the most important times to be in that customer flywheel because that's when a customer is actually talking about the product or service. That's when they're determining, do I really like this and do I like this enough to share it with my friends? Do I like it enough to share it with people who I don't know? Uh, they're building brand affinity. They're br building product affinity. And it's really important for brands, for agencies, for product marketers, for content marketers to be aware of what's happening when people are finding their affinity towards a product because that affinity leads to influence. Now, if influence then kind of leads to content, right? And if everybody's heard the phrase content is king, but what does that make context, right? So if content is king, what about context? Well, I believe context is the crown, right? Context is what's gonna make the king. And I don't know if everybody knows the Oreo example. Show of hands if anybody knows the Oreo example. Okay, so not a lot. So let me kind of give you the Oreo example in five seconds, right? It's the Super Bowl, uh, one of the biggest television moments and the lights go off in the stadium. Complete darkness for about 40 minutes, right? There, nobody can see anything of what's happening on the, the American football field. Um, and Oreo tweets out this picture saying you can still dunk in the dark. And that goes viral. I mean, for 40 minutes, basically, a number of people are sharing this content. And that's because Oreo picked up on the context of what was happening and they were able to leverage that into an actual opportunity for them to do content marketing. But it, all, it doesn't always work. Um, and context, if you don't have context, it can really backfire. Now, British Gas, and I'm, I'm, I hate talking about this because it's such a negative event, but British Gas decided that they were going to put something on Twitter, a hashtag on Twitter, and allow people to interact with them. So they called it Ask British Gas. Now, this was just after they had a whole lot of press around raising prices, around people not being able to afford energy bills. 
Um, so, you know, somebody very astutely, even before they started, said, you know, six minutes until the biggest social media car crash. And that's basically what happened. You know, everybody was either tongue in cheek, was very disparaging, or was very negative towards the brand. Um, and it really backfired in British Gas's face. But, it, I mean, it wasn't something that you or I couldn't predict was going to happen. Uh, what we see at, at Peer Index is a lot of companies are doing their social media around competitions because competitions then turn into performance marketing, right? They turn into traffic. So people like to push out, retweet this message to win, or here's a competition that we're doing, engage, and they're not really seeing if those people have affinity towards their product or service. And that can be dangerous because you're not really getting engaged customers. You're getting customers who care about price, who care about getting things free, and not necessarily getting the quality of the product or service that you're actually offering. Um, but some brands are really looking at context and not thinking about the product or service that they're offering. Uh, and this is an example of, of Tesco Mobile. And I think Tesco Mobile is doing a great job of actually looking at context, looking at information as it's happening, and leveraging that to make a content marketing strategy or a social media strategy. Uh, it's not in this example, but Tesco Mobile uh, responded to somebody who had tweeted that it's a real turnoff when a girl's mobile network is Tesco Mobile. So they responded with, uh, are you really in a position to turn down any girls? And that could have hit or miss. I mean, it's a risk, that's a really risky strategy. But it turned out to work. I mean, the person engaged back. They ended up sending that individual a package with a how to pick up girls, some deodorant, and a bunch of other things. And it became like a social media bit of a wave. And, and Tesco and Mobile is doing a, a really good, good job of kind of continuing that type of tone of voice. Um, and they've actually been able to engage other brands into that conversation uh, as well. Now, this doesn't always work. And as I was saying, most brands aren't in that Tesco mobile category. Most brands, when you look at their content marketing on social media and outside of social media, the, the content map that you tend to come out from with the data looks like this. A lot of competitions, a lot of win this, and the real kind of hidden gems are, are, won't show up. Because instead of their audiences talking about their everyday lives, their audiences are engaging with them purely on a competition basis. Now, if we look at this and if we look at a car brand that we're working with as an example, you know, this is a lot closer to, to what that car brand wanted to see. They wanted to see their brand talked about with five or six other challenger brands that they, they thought of as competitors. And after building up their content, after kind of getting their strategy right, they started to see this happen more and more. Um, and it's really starting to work for, for this car brand. Um, some of the other stuff that we're doing and helping brands do, and I think everybody should be doing this, whether they're doing it with our platform or not, is really measuring how active your audience is and what kind of time of day they're tweeting at and what type of activity they're seeing. And when you see spikes like this, that's a warning sign that your activity is actually quite competition driven or quite kind of uh, seasonal right, within the week. But when you see this, where it's actually happening that people are talking about either the brands or the activities you want them to talk about at peaks during the week, that's a good sign that your content marketing is actually working. Uh, we're doing some really cutting edge stuff and around clustering content. Uh, and we've got a number of data scientists and PhDs in, in maths kind of looking through Twitter and Facebook and other social media platforms to really determine what types of content they should be writing about. Now they can be writing about that content in print or in television ads or on other social media platforms. But what we enable brands to do is look at this and then make determinations around what types of archetypes, what types of individuals they want to be connecting with. So if you look at this one, we can, we've started to cluster these four different groups of audiences and we've helped a brand determine that actually they've got gamers, they've got theater goers, they've got football fanatics, and they've got their techies. And we can show them what to talk about when they're pitching a product at a particular audience. And we can also show them what not to talk about when they're talking to a particular audience. Just you know, time. Um, and I think this is a really big opportunity for everyone. Um, if everyone doesn't know who this is, this is Barack Obama. Um, and I think this is kind of where we're at. 
right? We're at that kind of early cusp when it comes to digital marketing, where we're not quite sure what we're going to turn out to be. And I think this is the time when we can really get great with our insights. We can get great with our analytics. And then we can really connect with our audiences. But there's a risk, right? There's always a risk that another brand or, or somebody else is going to come in and kind of take over our spotlight. Uh, this might be a bit of a dated meme, but the whole Kanye West coming on when Taylor Swift was getting her award and saying, I'm going to let you finish, but Beyonce had the best video. You know, you have to be aware of your competition and make sure they're not leveraging some of the brands and some of the ideas and some of the concepts that you're working on. Um, we've seen this happen a lot with some of the brands that we're working with where they might do sponsorship of a particular sporting event, but yet a competitor brand is actually indexing higher on that sporting event than they are. Right? And making sure that, is that money well spent? And I think social media is great, but I think we have to leverage some of that data and make other decisions in general marketing with that social media data and those insights that we can gain from that. I think the holy grail is when you, the audience doesn't know if it's marketing. When it's content that's really engaging the audience. And I think you know, the last speaker did a great job of showing how Pinterest can do that. But I think it's beyond Pinterest. I think it's on every marketing channel. We have, to be, we have to be really strong as marketers that we're not just broadcasting our message, that we're actually integrating and discovering what are the cruxes, what are the principles in people's lives that they're going to need our products and our services, and then engage with people in a way that they feel comfortable. Uh, just a little bit of a case study. Uh, I hope I don't offend anybody if I say this is probably the worst television show uh, in Britain right now. This is Geordie Shore. Uh, and, and what we found was one of the brands that we were working with, uh, they were really interested in the football audience and they wanted uh, football fanatics to be engaging with their brand. And what we found was actually their target audience was indexing really highly with Geordie Shore. Um, you know, they saw that, and this is kind of a little bit of what our product looks like, but you can see what somebody's community influence score is. So you can see how influential is a particular individual in my community of interest versus in the general broad park, broader community. Um, and what they saw was Gaz from Jordy Shore was indexing really highly and really influencing a lot of people that they cared about. So Cheryl Cole breaks up with her boyfriend. And this company is a gaming company, a betting company. So they put out a bet saying that Gaz was going to be the next boyfriend. Um, and that really spiked. People started to engage with that brand. And, and they were getting a lot of mentions uh, alongside a product. So they used social media to change a product. And not only did they change a product, but they changed their, their marketing strategy. So they started to incorporate more of these characters into campaigns. Uh, they started to, to raise more and more bets. And, and it actually generated a, a huge amount of traffic for them and a huge amount of bets, which is their end product. So how do we do this? Well, we're looking at a large amount of data. We're looking at all the channels, all the platforms that, that people are operating in. And as I mentioned, we've got a number of different data scientists who look at this and interpret this in the right way. Now, you can get a lot of this data from the likes of Data Sift and, and GNIP and Facebook. And you can start to, to build out this. But we kind of build a front, lit, front end layer to this to enable brands and marketing uh, teams to actually understand their audiences a lot better. Uh, I'm from Toronto, Canada, <laughs> so uh, I think every presentation for the next little while is going to have a picture of Rob Ford, uh, the great mayor of my former city. Uh, yeah, and um, you know, I, I, and the point I want to make with this though is that everybody's got these kind of little hidden things that they they sh they might want to cover up or they they might want to be aware of when those communities start talking about, and it's how do you engage with your communities without offending them, without really kind of losing your cool, losing your position. Don't become the next British gas. You know, be, be these brands that actually interact and, and engage with people on the content they care about. Um, I'm also an Arsenal supporter. So uh, you know, I, I, I think there's a, a big risk as well that at the end of a campaign, you, you miss your opportunity. Right? And I think there's, there's a really big risk of that. And the way not to miss that opportunity is to really kind of measure, to, to observe, and to interact in the right ways. So just a little bit about Peer Index um, and what we're doing. I've only been with Peer Index for a month. Uh, before that, I was turning around an e-commerce company. Before that, I was 
uh, head of my own ad tech startup. And before that, I was at Yahoo uh, <laughs> with a colleague in the audience, which is weird. But um, yeah, so I worked at Yahoo for a number of years doing customer acquisition. Um, but let me tell you a little bit about Pure Index. So I joined Pure Index because I really like the product that they're building now. And this is a snapshot of what, what we've done right now where you can log in after we've built your community and you can see individuals, you can build out lists of individuals that you want to connect with. You can see what content people are actually talking about and you can leverage those insights around content and build out your content marketing strategy. You can build out your, your offline strategy as well. You can build out partnerships and, and make kind of strategic decisions based on what the data is showing you. We do reporting around what your audience actually looks like, how many celebrities versus how many actual users, uh, what is the content that they're actually talking about to help you kind of report and measure the success of your content marketing strategy. Um, and we show great demographics as well around what that audience makeup is actually like. Um, and as I was saying before, we're, we're crunching a huge amount of data to enable us to do this. Uh, PyQ, which is our, our latest product, is uh, a reporting platform, is a content marketing platform, but it's based on social media, right? So we see a lot of signals and signs underneath. We measure who's influential in a particular topic, and we track and we trend content and people um, in spo social media, in communities that you actually care about. And that's it. I have no idea how I did for time, but I hope that's all right. Uh, thank you. <laughs>